I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So I wanted to speak to two comments that came up related to contentment. Um, the first is this one, which came to me anonymously. How can those of us who are seriously ill and possibly even dying find contentment with what is, particularly given what may be happening to us in the moment on the physical level? Very important. Uh, re related questions, certainly understandable ones, might be something like, how can I feel content when I'm aware of global warming or the state of the world? or so many people being mistreated near and far uh, in so many bad ways. How can I be content? <clears throat> so a couple ways into that question, it's a very legitimate questions. The first is that in a meditative practice, sometimes we explore certain procedures that are not yet accessible to us as a way of life, but we take them on as a kind of mental training or as sort of a probe into our own psychology uh, that is focused and deliberate and effective in surfacing things under, under, you know, underneath the rocks inside your mind. So uh, there are forms of meditation that are, as I talked about at the beginning last week, um, <clears throat> just pure open awareness, radically accepting, just being just sitting, open spaciousness, continually letting go, um, making the absolutely minimal efforts just to remain present, perhaps with a background sense of your breathing or your body. There's a place for those kind of meditations and there's a place for those as practice in life where we're simply being with what is being with pain in the body, being with outrage at the world, being with grief about dying or, or other feelings related to dying, just being with it. There's a place for that. And there is a place also for what are called absorption practices or shamatha practices meditatively or broadly, there's a place for deliberate cultivation of various qualities of mind, which is a context then in which we're we explored the deliberate, cult the deliberate cultivation of contentment. Now, then the question becomes, okay, how can I feel authentically free of craving in the present while dealing with um, a, a really scary medical diagnosis or appalling news about something in the world. First, um, there are certain things that are challenging. <laughs> and if they're challenging, it's okay to start easier. Can I feel content in this life with a very mild headache? Can I feel content with my career even with a little setback recently. You know, start small. Can I feel content uh, with this person as my friend, even if, um, you know, they've been a little annoying lately? Right? Start small. And then you go from there. But let's go all the way. Let's take a look at the edge cases, the really hard ones. Okay? Let's say that a person has recently received a diagnosis that they're, you know, in the final chapter of their life, most likely. Um, craving is the English translation commonly of the second noble truth. And someone else in the chat asked me about craving, uh, which we normally associate with things like craving for food or the next heroin fix, craving, craving adulation. Uh, the Buddha used that term extremely broadly, craving, 
in Pali, the language, a key language of early Buddhism, tanha, tanha, whose root is thirst. The biological basis for craving is a sense of something missing or wrong, an invasive sense of that. The question becomes, can we be with pain without craving the relief of pain? Can we wish for the relief of pain? Can we work for the relief of pain without the contraction and the aversive resistance to pain that is in craving? And the Buddha pointed us to a different way of relating to the very real pains. Just imagine what life was like 2,500 years ago in Northern India. Um, he's showing us that with training, we can have physical pain, we can have emotional pain, we can have important goals without the contractions, the insistence, and the underlying prior sense of something missing or wrong as we cope with life as best we can. That is incredibly hopeful. Maybe that's one of the reasons why the Buddha was known sometimes as the happy one. You know, he lived with pain, he lived with loss, and deep in his innermost being, he was at peace. That's what we're training ourselves in here, to be able to rest in that underlying peace in increasingly challenging situations. So we start with very, very mild headaches, in part so we can be prepared for the inevitable last year of our life, whenever it comes, or that, that final chapter, whenever it comes. All right. It's a little bit like the T.S. Eliot line that you may know, Teach us to care, teach us to care and not to care. Right. Healthy desire is in the care side, to love, to make efforts, to value, to go for it, to care. And on the other side, teach us not to care. That's the side of equanimity and contentment. Both, side by side. And then someone else asked me, uh, let's see here. Um, this is a person who said, essentially, it'll come to me. Um, Sorry, bear with me. Okay, basically the person essentially said, I'm a little afraid that if I'm content, I won't work hard enough. I won't pursue my goals. I won't you know, do what I can. And that's where it's really interesting to explore what it's like to feel content in the present. Like, oh wow, there is enough already. And keep dancing under the moonlight. You know, the Buddha kept, he, he kept living for 40 years, roughly, after his own enlightenment. Um, so we can feel content with the present while feeling morally committed to making a better future. We can feel content in the present while letting move through us uh, our values and uh, our inner currents of self-actualization as we express ourselves into the next moment while being content with the present one. Those two things can live very much side by side. And it's been extremely interesting for me uh, to explore what is it like to continue to be productive and goal-directed and disciplined in various ways while feeling already content. I'm still working on it, but it's a really it's a really interesting combination.
All right. That's what I wanted to say about contentment. Um, so I'd like to uh, do a quick uh, review of the seven ways to practice with regrets that I talked about last week. And I'll give you the list. I know people have wanted the list. And then I'm very interested in opening it up to questions that have come in and or disagreements even about what I've said here. All right. So um, <clears throat> we all have regrets. We all have we all um, have made mistakes that we regret. Uh, I'm focused here on regret applied to uh, our own actions uh, or inactions. It's it's normal. It's an important territory. It's been one that I've personally uh, found a lot of uh, uh, meaningfulness in recently, including a kind of liberating. As I've practiced with regrets, I feel increasingly freer, frankly, uh, myself uh, in the present. So let's talk a little bit about ways to practice yourself with regrets. And because this can be painful, difficult material, I'd like to reiterate what I said last week, which is, you know, touch this to the extent that it's useful for you. Uh, disengage if it's too much. Focus on mild to moderate regrets, probably. Uh, I think that's quite useful. Um, and as I said also last week, we're going to start with resourcing ourselves. So seven practices for dealing with regrets. The first uh, is to establish yourself in that which is a refuge for you so that you can face regrets without being flooded by them. It could be a deliberately practicing an inner calming, it might be bringing to mind your allies, maybe ancestor figures, spirit figures who are with you as you um, become brave enough to face your regrets. Uh, sense of understanding, the refuge of understanding, why you're going to deliberately go into that material to clear it out so it doesn't burden you so much. You know, establish yourself, resource yourself. I call that refuge. Second, have insight into the nature of both regrets and the process of regretting and the apparent one who has regrets. Uh, the Buddha's, one of his central contributions was to point out that the nature of all thoughts and things, all mind and all matter, energy included with matter, E equals MC squared, um, the nature of all that is that everything is made of parts that are connected and changing, thus empty of so absolute solidity, absolute identity, absolute um, independence of causes and conditions. Everything is a process occurring in relationship with other processes. And that insight, which can be very conceptual at first, but when it's applied to something like a regret, is you start relating to it much more as a fluid, dynamic, cloud-like process uh, than a solid brick, uh, you know, that you're carrying around. Similarly, if you look directly at the apparent I, quote unquote I, who is regretting, you look really closely, huh, who is this I? What is this I that has regrets? The parts that are connected and changing of that apparent I um, are existing, they're occurring, they're occurring as intangible experiences, but they're occurring. They're real in the sense of intangible experiences being real. Um, but they too are empty. They too are fluid. They too are loose. And you can notice that the more that you relate to the regret as a solid, chunky, stuck thing, you suffer more. Similarly, if you have this kind of essentialized, reified, thingified sense of self, 
as an entity who is having experiences of regret, the more you relate to yourself in that way, the tighter the fist is and the more the contraction and the more the suffering. On the other hand, if you can directly observe with insight that um, the things we regret and the experiences of regret and the, the one who did the bad thing that we regret, that you regret, all of that, if you can, you know, with insight, as the Buddha recommends, unpack it and realize more and more its nature as empty, as fluid, that is a real help. Okay? Third, in the process, now that you've resourced, you've settled in refuge and you've kind of mobilized insight, vipassana is insight. Okay? We have to feel it to release it. So you unpack it. You go into the particular thing. You might pick something quite mild, quite small. Maybe I, I talked about having regret about inviting a, a young woman, a girl in high school to the prom and then backing out as a shy, awkward, embarrassed uh, kid. I wasn't mean about it. I didn't do horrible things, but I know, I feel sad. I regret it. I did that. I wish I'd had the courage um, to kind of hang in there with it all. I wish I'd had the closeness with my parents that I could have talked to them about it and they could have said, hey, Rick, it's totally normal. And is there anything we can do to make it easier for you? And it's okay. You, you still want to go ahead. You'll be glad you did. You know, I regret that I didn't have that kind of relationship with them. I hadn't made that kind of relationship with them myself. So, yeah. so pick something mild, and then when you go into it, pull it apart, let it let it open up. You might do it systematically, like okay, what are what are you know the the emotions here? I have all right. What are the body sensations as I unpack this experience to air it out? What are the thoughts I have about it? What are the desires I have related to it? You know, what is all that was in the mix of it? This is the unpacking phase where we're, we're going into it while we're airing it out. What were some of the many factors in the mix? I was very young going through school. I was shy. I was awkward. I didn't know. I didn't know how to talk to girls. Oh, my gosh. Um, et cetera. You know, everything. Everything. Um, so you... That's the, that's the third step. We're feeling it. We're stepping into the experience, which we need to do to step through it. We're unpacking it. While resourcing ourselves and maintaining our insights so that we can do this process constructively for ourselves. That's the third step. Fourth is repair. So in repair, we can look at what happened in the past and the efforts we've made already to repair. Now, maybe they couldn't be with the particular person. Like, for example, I lost touch with that, with that person um, when I left high school. I was kind of so embarrassed about it all that I, I sort of disengaged from her while I was um, in high school. Uh, this was my senior year. And um, so I can't repair with her directly, but it's been important to me over the years to really th reflect more and more on my impact on others, even if I'm not trying to be evil, but still I impact them. And in particular, to be honorable and respectful and decent, uh, you know, in my interactions with women, frankly, particularly, you know, when I was dating before I got married, you know, that's been a form of repair. So you might ask yourself, what are the forms of repair you've already enacted? perhaps directly with the people you might have wronged or the mistakes you might have made, uh, or by learning your lesson. That's a form of repair. Uh, maybe by really mobilizing um, good intentions, you know, in the future, right? You've done, what you, you've done a lot already. Give yourself credit for that. Acknowledge it. See it clearly. And then ask yourself, is there more I could do? The answer may well be no. 
you've really done everything you could given the scale of the the thing that you regret and all of it and the complexities and the possibilities. You've done what any reasonable, good-hearted, well-intended um, person could do. Good on you. Or it might come up, you know, there's more I could do. Maybe, maybe, maybe I should do this. You could write a letter to a person you can't possibly communicate with and write the letter and then release it, you know, to the universe, to the divine. Write it and then burn it and scatter the ashes, whatever, you know, repair. Okay? Fifth step, releasing. Now that you've really unpacked and opened to and seen and taken responsibility, by the way, that's another major aspect of repair, taking responsibility for your part, owning your part. That's part of repair, okay? Now you've done those things. Steps five, releasing. Deliberately helping the feelings of regret pass through awareness. Deliberately letting go of maybe beliefs you know, you, cre you created about how horrible it was when it really wasn't that horrible what you did. You could put it in context. Releasing those beliefs, those thoughts. Releasing maybe desires. Maybe because you regret something that happened in a relationship with someone, you've been trying to placate and appease them ever since and somehow please them and, and uh, you know, get back in their good graces. And maybe you just kind of give that up. Like, okay, I, I blew it and I blew it with you and then you overreacted to me and then I've been trying to get back in your good graces ever since and you won't let me in and you keep holding a grudge and you keep trying to punish me and you know, I'm going to let that go from now on. I'm releasing that one. I see I see clearly, you know, I've, I've felt what I, I've seen what I've done and then I've repaired it as best I can, including taking responsibility for my part, and trying to repair with you and okay, I'm letting this one go. Releasing. There's some practical things people can do, like, uh, you know, writing a letter and then, you know, releasing it out in the world. Um, also, imagining putting your regrets into a little boat by the side of a river, a big river, headed all the way out into the ocean, and then letting the river carry the regrets away. Or me, you know, I, I might imagine putting my regrets in a spaceship and sending it into the heart of the sun, deconstructing it to its constituent particles, releasing, and then replacing, replacing, replacing what you've released, step six. So, you know, for example, maybe you are releasing a sense of shame and remorse, and you're replacing it, not with denial, this is not a spiritual bypass, but replacing that sense of, you know, shame and <sighs> feeling really like, kind of like a bad person with, huh, feeling a sense of worthiness for all kinds of reasons, including that you did this process, right? Wow. So, um, you're replacing. Maybe you're replacing those old beliefs you're letting go of with new beliefs. Maybe you're replacing, um, you know, a sense of contraction with a sense of softening and opening. A major thing to turn toward related to regret is resting in what I call deep green or the home base, notably love. Love very much what we regret involves other people, including ourselves. We can regret our impact on others. We can regret choices we made that impacted ourselves. Okay. Well, when we rest in a genuine felt sense of love, regret is kind of squeezed out of the space. Try it. You know, you bring to mind someone that you hurt, you wounded perhaps, 
There are people in my life that I've wounded, I've injured. And it's interesting when you stay centered in love while being aware of them, you still see clearly, but it's a lot softer. It's less painful. And you're replacing regrets in that case with love. Also replacing with forgiveness. Really focusing on deliberate processes of forgiving yourself. You might ask for forgiveness from the person you injured or impacted if you can, if it's appropriate. If not, it's not. You might imagine other beings or real people that you ask them to forgive you for that. It can be weirdly effective, you know. Um, you know, I should do this. Turn to Jan and say, Jan, can you forgive me for, you know, asking that girl to the prom and then backing out? And I know that was really devastating for her. Can you, Jan, forgive me for that? Even though Jan was not involved, she wasn't in my high, was not in my high school. It can be weirdly effective to do things like that. We are most of us carrying around so many things that it's not like most most of us are not narcissistic sociopaths who could sure use some more shame and remorse. Most people are not like that. Most people carry much more than their fair weight of shame and remorse, unprocessed, just kind of you know, in the background. They're carrying a load of bricks around which can become almost the new normal. We hardly notice it. But when you step back and look at it, you realize, wow. And after you shed it, whew, you feel so much lighter. Wow. And that shedding only happens after you go through the process, the lawful, legitimate, moral process that I've sketched here, which you've really faced things and taken responsibility and repaired as best you can. So forgiveness. If you like... Um, the chapter on generosity and resilient uh, that I wrote with Forrest, our son, um, has a really nice section on the giving of forgiving, forgiving others as well as forgiving yourself, forgiveness. So these are all things you can replace regrets with. That's number six. And then seven, at a certain point, ah, you know, <laughs> Maybe it's after doing what I've described for 45 seconds or maybe 45 minutes, but at some point, <sighs> okay, and you give yourself permission to turn a corner. You may still be aware of the regret. It may still come to mind. You may still wince when you, when you recall it. Um, but more and more, it doesn't burden you. You're not preoccupied with it. You're not returning to it deliberately. If it comes to mind, you look at it, you're aware of it for a breath or two or three, and then you give yourself a little relief and reassurance and permission to turn a corner and live onward in your life. Live well, meanwhile. Right? It's okay. Take a breath and you know, live onward. It doesn't mean suppressing it or denying it. It just means not carrying it around anymore, you know, Whew. setting it down and moving onward. So those are the seven suggestions that I had for how to practice with regret. And um, now I want to take a look at comments and, um, you know, what people have said here and maybe some questions. Uh, I like questions that are, you know, kind of succinct and direct that I can deal with. So let me just take a peek here. Okay, um, you can see questions and comments that are in the public space. Um, and um, I'll see if there's a specific question here. Um, I think it is startling to appreciate in our common humanity the simple fact that uh, so many of us, me included, are, you know, dealing with what we learned when we were young. You know, I'm still dealing with patterns I acquired in my early childhood. 
having done all, still a lot of practice. I'm still dealing high school. Oof. You know, junior high, I'm still trying to break out of patterns I acquired in my elementary school and um, junior high school years. So it's normal that we're, you know, affected by the past and regretting things to the extent that we are. Okay, so let's see if there's some any question here. Um, great. People are commenting, they're tracking what I'm saying. I appreciate that. I'm not yet seeing a question. Um, oh, so somebody asked me, can I uh, use an example of a regret of how you acted with one of your children? Sure. And um, so, uh, so I'm a professional writer. That's one of my <laughs> occupations, part time. And so when our kids were in school, <clears throat> uh, there's a famous ex example that Forrest teases me about. Um, you know, he said, "Oh, so Dad, I I think he was in sixth grade or something, or maybe a little farther along." Uh, so, Dad, uh, you know, I want to. Um, I have to write this report. You know, maybe he's a ninth grader. Uh, what do you think? So he showed me his report, and I just went on autopilot and started line editing it, just standard stuff, and marking it up to kind of teach him. You know, well-crafted sentences, clarifying your point. You know, simplifying direct language. Just the kind of input I've received, you know, from editors in New York who line edited, you know, my my early efforts. Well, that was not good. <laughs> he felt criticized. He felt embarrassed. It wasn't his work. Put him in an awkward position. I wasn't mean about it. I wasn't like yelling at him, you know, about it. But I just, I went overboard. I was on autopilot. I got carried away. I regret that. And it kind of, um, I regret also that it, um, canceled my vote forever after, you know, like he would never bring anything else for me to look at, you know, that I could be helpful with. So regret. And, you know, so to do an example about that, I'll do it kind of succinctly here. All right, now I'm talking about <laughs> overcorrecting Forrest Book Report. <sighs> All right, I'm accessing refuge. All right, that's good. Okay, try finding insight, and I'm doing this at warp speed here. Insight, yeah, into the nature, so many things flying around, so many things, habits. I was an A student as a kid, you know, I like getting A's, all that, um, in the mix, swirling around. Okay, so many things, insight. And the one today who regrets is much more like a fluid process than a single entity. All right, that's good. Third, feeling it. Well, thanks. You know who you are who asked me this question. <laughs> you know, what I mean, feeling it, feeling it. I don't want to feel my feelings anyway. So okay, yeah, yeah, I could totally feel it. You know, I'm doing it fast here, so I feel it, and I, yeah, 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 feel this combination of irritation with him and irritation with myself for going overboard. Okay, repairing. I've made a lot of repairs. I never did it again. Uh, I uh, apologized. Uh, I have apologized since. I've taken a fair number of shots <laughs> on the dinner table in adulthood. My kids bringing up this sort of thing. Dad went overboard. Oh boy. Uh, not just once either. Let me tell you, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, repairing. What else could I do? I think this one I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Forrest about it, but it's probably okay, I think. Okay, releasing. All right. Yeah, yeah. Part of releasing is realizing the good intentions that were mixed up with the problematic impacts. Yeah, I was trying to help. I was probably showing off a little. But still a lot. I I really was trying to be helpful because I thought these are skills that are useful to show them how to do it, you know. Uh, so I can, you know, release, 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 let it go. Okay. What parent among us has not erred either in the side of being too permissive or too controlling? I probably swung hard and 
both directions at various times. Okay, replacing. Replacing with a sense of being a good enough dad. Nobody's a perfect parent, but good enough. I think I really was net-net, you know, total score, pretty okay. All right. And then move on. Yeah. Forrest is 36. It's okay. Moving on. Yeah. All right. That was a fairly mild one. I'm sure people have it might say, well, Rick, what about? Or yes, but, you know, and then obviously the bigger the regret, the more thorough the practice must be and the slower. You can't do it at warp speed, obviously. You know, you got to take your time with it. Okay, so questions or comments? So now I'm seeing people... Okay. I really like this uh, comment from Gina. Hello, Gina. Um, contentment is also a springboard to the vast newness, adventures out there awaiting us. That's very beautiful. Contentment helps us be very receptive at the front edge of now as we receive that which is coming. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so let's see, any specific questions? Um, can it be like grief where that regret may pop up again? Yeah, I think that's really true. I mean, regrets may come back just like grief, you know? Uh, but do they hijack us? You know, if you're just sort of sitting around and you're flipping through your high school yearbook and you suddenly see somebody that you were mean to 50 years ago, it's a, it's appropriate to feel some regret about that. All right. Uh, so, you know, we stumble on things, we feel regret, but that's really different from having, a you know, a lot of specific things we regret that we're preoccupied with or a global sense of regret about life. And, you know, it's taken me some years, actually, to work through a number of regrets I've had about myself as a father. And there's certain big things that can take some time to work through. But can you work through them? Are you working through them? Are you engaging these as practice? Are you helping your interior to shift? Regrets are interior. They're inside the mind. Regrets are in the inner world. Can you practice in your inner world skillfully, steadily, with a whole heart, at a pace that's okay for you, producing lasting beneficial changes along the way? Good change that lasts. That's the only question. There's no question about what's there. Whatever's there is there, including down in the basement, under wraps. It's there, even if it's under wraps. Question is, are we practicing with it and how we relate to it and how we engage it? Okay. <clears throat> yep, it yep. Uh, if regrets come back, like big regrets, does it mean we haven't practiced enough? Uh, no, no, it means we did good practice and. Uh, you know, we need to take another crack at it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it just means, oh, okay. Uh, you know, I think there are things that I've processed, you know, hundreds of times. And then, and sometimes we have to process them hundreds of time for the times, for this thousandth time to be finally curative and to truly pull the whole stack. So it's okay. Uh, and often it means that, hmm, what, what's left here? What's at a deeper level? It could be that the regret has an automaticity to it. We have to be careful about that. On the other hand, maybe there really is something that's underneath the surface here that would be releasing to get more in touch with. Yeah. Another very important thing to say, of course, is that even if there's a, a, a sense of regret about um, 
you know, roads not taken uh, that you cannot go back to and you regret the impact of all that. Uh, you know, there are things I regret that led to the irrevocable, um, you know, ending of certain relationships and can't do it, you know, can't change those. Okay. And today, can you live in a way that you will not regret tonight? And can you do that tomorrow and the day after? And one of the best ways to deal with past regrets, um, including a more, a more global sense of regret, is to know that you've put one good day in front of another. So that increasingly, there's more and more daylight more and more space between you now, day after day after day, that now, day after day, out here, more and more space from the regrets back here. Really good. Really, really good. Some months ago, my wife called me out for um, speaking sharply to her about something. And I think the content of what I had to say was um, true. I'm not sure how useful it was, but it was true. But I, you know, I wrapped it in a kind of sharpness that had impact on her. And I realized that I have this capacity, you know, to kind of bring the heat. And I told her, I said, I'll just never do that again. And really, basically, I haven't. And so I regret speaking sharply to her, and I regret times in the past I've, sp I've spoken sharply to others. I sure do feel good. <laughs> Really, really, I just have not spoken sharply since. And I've really been on top of it and I've watched it and I may have spoken firmly and she and I might disagree slightly about what is really sharp, but um, I, I know for myself that I really have not spoken sharply since. And that really helps me get more and more daylight from that which I regret. And you might think about that for yourself. You know, maybe... You know, I, I think about, you know, maybe you regret um, using drugs or alcohol. Well, okay. Don't use today. Don't use tomorrow. I know, easier said than done. But one day at a time, really. Maybe you regret uh, kind of being angry with people. Okay. Don't be angry at people today. You might feel it underneath it all, but don't, don't know what your line is. Know what your good enough um, person code is. What is your good enough person code? You know, the Buddha, he laid out very five in particular, very simple guidelines. Don't kill today. Don't steal today. Don't lie today. Don't, um, you know, exploit sexuality today. Don't harm yourself or others with sexuality today. Don't cheat on your partner today. And don't get drunk today. You know, don't use intoxicants to the point that they cloud your mind and lead to heedlessness. Maybe you don't use them at all. Five simple precepts. Right? So you, we, most of us know what is our own code. For a, for a day without regret, you know? Realistic. If you want to meditate, okay, meditate for a minute or more so you don't regret it, all right? And I think there's this sort of intermediate zone between regret and I kind of wish I had, but you know, it's not, a big enough deal that I regret not doing it. But, you know, it's in the growing list of what I, you know, want to be doing. Okay, that's a category. But the stuff especially that has the sting of regret, and you know what those things are, um, 
if you can specify for yourself, and this could be really useful to do, what is a good enough day? Write it down. If you, if you tend to be at all self-critical or uneasy about your worth, this is an incredibly useful exercise. You know, what's a, what's a day that you can go to the, you know, what's the kind of a day such that you can go to bed at night without regret about the day? And in fact, with a sense of um, self-worth about it. And then do that. And know you did it. <laughs> That's an incredible practice. Very simple, right? Very concrete, very specific, not airy fairy at all. And a very, very beautiful way to um, suffer a lot less, right? Alongside other more kind of, kind of contemplative type practices. Okay, so I'm going to finish up here. I really applaud you for hanging in there with this topic uh, and and facing it. I hope you do not regret facing the topic of regrets. <laughs>